Hello again, it's Rob Sarmanian with Oakson. We are at Woods Hole, Massachusetts, the first leg of our journey today, heading over to Martha's Vineyard to build a Perkrite drip dispersal system. Our destination today is called Aquina, which is the westernmost part of the island. So it's actually about another 45 minute ride. Kind of interesting about the island is the, the many different soil types on such a small footprint. So you think, you know, Cape Cod, the islands, you think of beach sand and whatnot. And sure, there are plenty of areas that have that. But the part of the island we're going to is quite different. It's very dense clay-like material. So when we get there, we'll see what we get. And uh, but I have a pretty good idea of what to expect since we've done uh, many of these before. So we've arrived at the site and we're doing some final preparations before we install the equipment. The excavator is trenching for the force mains. You can see that the, the sand bed where the drip tubing is gonna be installed is fairly close to the house. But what, is, what isn't evident at this perspective is that it's a very irregular shaped field. So let's go take a look at the plan and I'll show you what I mean. As you can see on the plan, we have a very irregular shaped bed, serpentine shaped, about 100 feet long with six runs of perkrite drip dispersal tubing. And it's pretty close to the house. So we have some corners close to the house, tanks are very tight. So it's not gonna be uh, an easy installation from moving equipment and moving dirt around, but from a Perkrite perspective, it'll go very nicely to follow that irregular shape. So at this point, we're kind of mobilizing, getting everything out of the vehicle. The excavation contractor is doing some final touches with the sand bed and will be laying tubing momentarily. Locating the hydraulic unit on top of the tank is an important step in building the Perkrite drip dispersal system. There's a few considerations. So I'm gonna set it about here for now. This will be the riser for the, for the pump. So we're gonna be able to come out of this knockout and go into the pump supply. We have the gravity return line that's going to have pitch all the way back into the primary tank. And then from this vantage point, we have the supply and the return lines that we're going to drop down, come around this corner, around this corner, and we're going to build the manifold along this 12 foot span for the six runs of drip dispersal tubing two feet on center. So that's gonna be the perfect spot for the location of the hydraulic unit. So now it's time to pipe it all together. So at this point we have the manifold built and dropped into the trench and the guys are backfilling it so the uprights are slightly pitching towards the field. This makes it easy to make the connection from the upright lateral into the drip tubing so everything will drain into the tubing at the end of the pump cycle. So currently the manifold is just stubbed in from the end and we have the pipes that we're going to bring around the corner to the hydraulic unit. Manifold is installed, sand is all raked out, and you can see our team started painting lines to keep the tubing on course. So we're prepping to pull the tubing now. So we're setting up the wheelbarrow pulley system. The coil sits right on there, and as they pull on the end, it uncoils and they're going to bring this all the way down to the manifold side. Typically on a 
straight okay. field without bends and twists and whatnot, we can just measure, say, you know, six pieces, 100 feet long, drag them in and stake them down. In this case, we are doing it one at a time following the serpentine nature of the field and staking them down. So now that the drip dispersal tubing has been installed, our team is cutting the rigid foam boxes at the sand grade to prepare to tie the tubing in to the vertical risers that went into the supply and return lines all the way back to the hydraulic unit. Tied in right there. Once the ridge is off, we'll do the same thing with the black armor flex. Chop the one inch pipes down, glue on a 90 connector and tie it into the tubing. The drip dispersal tubing went in very uniform. So here are six runs at the end. The loop connections are in place and they make their way all the way down the field twisting and turning as needed, like no other wastewater system can do for you. Each run is 100 feet long, and it ends at the manifold, which final preparations are being made for the tie-in. Of the six uprights, two of them will have air release valve, one on the supply, one on the return, and the other four connections will just be straight 90s into the drip dispersal tubing. All right, so now I'm gluing together the connections to go from the drip tubing to the uprights. I've already cut this one down. A 90 will go on there. We're gonna glue this together. The air valve goes on the supply and the return, one of each. So this particular upright will be an air valve, like so. Another piece of PVC between the reducer and the barb connector, and it goes right into the tubing. So let's take a look. Not hard to do at all, just got to take your time, make sure you get everything.
And that's the first connection. Five more to go. So everything is completely built and we're at the point now where we're gonna do a clean water test. The clean water test is gonna consist of us just plugging the pump in to an extension cord. The electrician still has a few more connections to make to the panel and then we'll run it off of the, uh, the full control system. So we're gonna have our contractor, Nick, plug in the pump and I'm gonna head over to the field and purge the air valves. The first line that's going to come out is the supply feed. So I'm allowing any sand that might have gotten the pipes to bleed out. So now Nick's going to unplug the pump. And I'm going to, I'm going to secure the air valve on here. Now when the pump is energized again, it's going to fill up the tubing and we're going to flush out the return side. So. So the clean water is entering the manifold through the supply side, filling up all the tubing, looping around, coming back. Eventually, it's going to come out and bleed out this open return manifold. Now the pressure is going to be diminished, clearly, because there's friction loss through the tubing. So the, the strength of the, of the spout that you saw in the supply will be a lot less here. Also, there's a lot of air kind of you know, burping out of the line. We'll give it another few seconds and then we'll let Nick kill the pump. And once this air valve is secured, we have a closed system and we'll be able to check our flow rate. So the pressure test was a success. The tubing is full, pressurized, all the air is bleeding out and we are dripping as you can see. And the last item we will do is provide a flow rate. So we are going to time the flow meter on the hydraulic unit to see that the flow rate in the field matches what the flow rate should be on the design. And the way we figure out flow rate is we take the linear feed of drip tubing, divide it by two. That'll give you the amount of emitters in the system. You multiply that number by 0.61, which is the rate of the emitter, and that's in gallons per hour. And then you divide that number by 60, and it gives you the flow rate in gallons per minute. So let's go do that. So at the hydraulic unit, we're making the final electrical connections and at the same time, we can measure the flow rate. So I'll let you guys take a look. And when it gets to zero, start, start your clocks, go. And we will figure out our flow rate. So with 600 linear feet of tubing, we're looking at a flow rate of around three gallons per minute. So each revolution of that middle bottom dial would be one gallon so every 20 seconds that one should go around every number on the clock for that dial represents a tenth of a gallon so we can actually measure the flow rate of this system to a, a, a very high tolerance so it gives us great precision on monitoring how the system performs both at startup 5 10 20 years down the line 